Hi everyone, welcome to week five, and week five also happens to be the second and final week of unit two. Uh, so this week I want to talk about this idea of coercive federalism and throw out some ideas what co about coercive federalism so that we can discuss it more in the discussion board where I ask you to write a little bit of an essay on that. So let's get right into that. Well, for this lecture, I relied heavily on the Kincaid article in the Meek and Thurmeyer text. And this is what Kincaid says uh, course of federalism is. These points here, uh, these seven or eight points here, describe what he says course of federalism really is. When we have course of federalism will observe these conditions, that the federal government is the dominant policymaker, that the federal government can assert policy unilaterally over the states, that state and elected officials actually sometimes act as lobbyists when they deal with the federal government, not necessarily as partners. And you can read the rest of these points until you get to this final one, which says state and local decision areas are infused with federal rules. So, um, what he's trying to say here is that even when we talk about activities that states engage in, for example, the building of highways, um, that activity is not something that the state has complete discretion on. When a state builds uh, or repairs an interstate highway, there is funding coming from the federal government, but there's state funding as well. But the state is not free to uh, build its highway system to the interstate highway system to its own standards. It has to follow federal rules. So basically in many areas in state and local uh, government, there are federal rules that greatly apply. So this is this idea of coercive federalism that the federal government literally coerces states and localities into conducting the business of government by federal rules. And Kincaid goes on to talk about some of these elements of coercive federalism. And, and I want to talk about a few of these in the following slides. I won't talk about all of them, but in particular, uh, we want to talk about this impact of uh, how federal aid dollars have shifted from what we would say places, which are states or localities, to persons, literally individuals. Um, we want to talk about this area of mandates. Um, we want to talk about... Uh, intergovernmental policy making, and we want to talk about judicial interventions just a little bit. So this is a rehash of a slide that I presented to you last week. And last week, remember, I said that Social Security really, um, in spite of what some people say, Social Security really was a demonstration of cooperative federalism. Um, you know, what we traditionally think of as Social Security is Title II, the old age insurance, and that is indeed administered by the federal government. But other titles of uh, Social Security were and still are administered by the states, even though the dollars come from uh, the federal government uh, primarily. Um, the states still administer unemployment. Um, the states still administer the follow-on to the Aid for Dependent Children program, which is called TANF, Temporary uh, Assistance for Needy Families. So it is a demonstration of cooperative federalism, and it's also a demonstration of cooperative federalism in something of a negative sense. And this is where I, I bold-faced Title II there. Um, what I want you to look at are these exclusions. You know, in 1935, when Social Security was passed, there were really, really several categories of workers who weren't included in Social Security, and if the law hadn't been uh, amended over several decades, they still wouldn't be included. So uh, some of the categories of, of workers that were excluded from Social Security were agricultural workers, domestic workers, casual laborers, self-employed persons, government workers at all levels, meaning civil service in the federal government and state governments and local governments. Um, military personnel were not originally in Social Security, nor were merchant mariners and employees of most nonprofit organizations. So there really, really were a lot of workers who weren't ever going to get Social Security and didn't pay into it. 
But the, those first three categories, agricultural workers, domestic workers, and casual laborers, those stipulations were actually put into the Social Security law uh, at the behest of Southern congressmen and senators. Um, because, as it turns out, uh, most of the African Americans who lived in the United States in 1935 were resident in the South, and most of the occupations that African Americans were engaged in uh, were agriculture and domestic work and casual laborers. And so, um, at the the Roosevelt administration had to compromise on that and put that into the law in order to get Social Security passed. So, in a in a negative sense. That's a, a real example of, if you will, cooperative federalism, um, but fe cooperative federalism used actually to discriminate. So I throw this slide in here. Um, this is from some of my own research, but what I want to demonstrate here is that uh, what I call in my research the social contract of budgets really changed in the 1960s uh, and, and onward. And what happened was that uh, defense spending, which I, I happen to, a lot of my research is in defense budgets, um, as a share of the uh, federal budget, about 1970 was eclipsed by what we call human resources spending. And human resources, in as a super category or super function, uh, as the Office of Management and Budget calls them, um, Human resources includes such things as Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. It also includes the federal uh, pension and retirement programs for civil service, the military, and others. Um, and so what we see here is that around 1970, human resources um, overtook defense as a dominant share of federal budgets. And it's probably going to stay that way forever unless something drastic changes that equation. Um, now, that's not to say, by the way, that defense spending has really decreased. Um, it hasn't. Um, and I put uh, a really interesting link down there for uh, some of you, because I know a lot of you are either in the military or the Guard or Reserve, or have been. Um, and... It's, it's a really interesting uh, take from the Council on Foreign Relations on defense spending. But um, this is important because what this really demonstrates, not so much that defense spending has uh, suffered at, you know, vis-a-vis -vis human resources spending, but that human resources is and will be for the foreseeable future the dominant share of the federal budget. And Kincaid has a chart that's kind of similar to that, and it says 2001 because this chart, um, even though it's in the text, initially came from an article he wrote in 2001. And really what this is telling you is the dash line is, you know, what we call payments to individuals. So, for example, Medicaid, Medicare are payments to individuals explicitly. Um, Social Security is a payment to an individual. So... Um, uh, Social Security is not an aid program, and Medicare is not an aid program, but Medicaid is, and Medicaid dollars flow through the states. Um, and so what we see here is that uh, state and local aid, that is aid directly to governments themselves, have suffered actually because of the emphasis on uh, aid to individuals. And so what, what's the implication of that? Well, the implication, one of the implications of that is that there's budget pressures on state overall budgets. So up there at the top, I, you see I mentioned overall budgets. So most of you have taken um, the budget and finance course, or you're going to, and from that, you know that most states, you know, you could break up most states' budgets into two two budgets really. One is the general budget, which comes from, is funded by tax dollars and other revenue sources within the state, and the overall budget. And the overall budget really is heavily impacted by revenue from the federal government, and it's going to pay uh, for programs mandated by the federal government. So this, this happens to be from the 2015 Nebraska Consolidated Annual Financial Report, or CAFR. 
which I'm sure if you've all tried to read Kaffirs, you know what, what fun they are to read. But what you see here on the right-hand side is um, that about 41.3% of Nebraska's budget is health and human health and social services. Well, you know, a lot of those are mandated. And a lot of that 41.3% really is Medicaid. And then you see that about 21 or about, yeah, about 21% is education. That's K-12 education. Um, so that's really, those are the big things that states spend a lot of their money on. But this is the total budget in Nebraska. And on the left-hand side, you see that supporting that is about 60% in taxes within the state. And then operating grants is about 30%. Those operating grants are mostly federal dollars to run those programs. So this this represents Nebraska's overall budget, which is about twice as big as its general fund. And this slide is from the National Association of State Budget Officers, and uh, also known as NASBO. And what they look at a lot are general funds in the states. Um, general funds are those funds that really the states worry about the most. So if you actually took the time to go watch uh, the Nebraska legislature, or your own state's legislature in action, you, what you'd see them arguing about, mostly when they talk about budgets, is their general fund budget. Finding the sources of revenue to fund government activities in the state, the things that, that under federalism, that state is responsible for doing. But even this budget is heavily impacted by other programs. So you see, uh, on average, across the 50 states in 2015, about 19.3% of general fund budgets, that is, budgets that are funded within the state, went to Medicaid. And then about 35% of general fund budgets on average are uh, for K-12 education. And then you see higher education in there at about 10%. So really between, if you took the typical general fund of a state, uh, between K-12 education, Medicaid, and higher education, there's not a lot of room for other things. Um, and so the idea that states have to pitch in for Medicaid, actually the point that Kincaid is making is that puts pressure on the rest of the general fund budget because um, in, in certain senses budgeting is really a zero-sum game. Um, you know, uh, states, a lot of states, my home state of Nebraska included, are required to have balanced budgets. So when the Nebraska legislature makes its budget, it has to be balanced. That is in the state constitution. So uh, absent raising taxes, the only way to balance a budget is to, um, you know, is to cut programs. So, as I said, implications of this shift. If 50% of all federal aid to states is Medicaid, then that puts pressure on other areas. Um, so state budgets are coupled to federal aid programs. Um, this point that states become an administrative agents of the federal government, this is a big point in what Kincaid is trying to say. Um, you know, that wasn't necessarily the original design. It's a federalism design that other countries do have. For example, in South Korea. South Korea is a federalist constitution, but uh, the in the Constitution, the, the provincial and local governments are clearly subservient to the federal government. Um, that's stated. Uh, but in our version of federalism, we know that that wasn't necessarily clearly stated that the federal government would be, in, in hierarchy, the coercive uh, government in the setup. And so the bottom line is states continue to struggle with budgets um, and one of the reasons they struggle, um, on top of others, is that they are carrying out federal programs partially with state dollars. Um, what's another example of another implication of this coercive federalism? Well, uh, you know, coercive federalism means that uh, the federal government compels state behavior. So, for example, uh, we now... Uh, across the United States, the, the legal drinking age is 21. Well, that happened because uh, at a point in time, Congress said 
that we will cut off federal highway funding unless you raise your drinking age to 21. So states complied. Um, same with the blood alcohol testing standards. Basically, those are pretty much the same in all states. And again, that is because there was uh, the threat from the federal government that highway funds would be cut off unless you complied with um, what is basically the blood alcohol count standard. Um, more recently, uh, this year, um, the Justice Department has said, and I think the Education Department has told the state of North Carolina that due to its so-called bathroom bill, um, they could lose uh, about $3 million in federal um, education aid. So these are examples of compelling state behavior. And so we want to spend a couple of slides here talking about this issue of mandates. What are mandates? Mandates are really just, you know, programs that um, the federal government says states need to do. Um, mandates didn't used to be a big deal. You know, there were only a few mandates prior to about 1970. And then in the 70s and 80s, there were more than 50 federal mandates, which led to kind of a revolt. And this, this law called the Unfunded Mandate Reform Act of 1995, which turns out to be a, a good a law that states pushed for and wanted, but it turns out that um, it hasn't necessarily been real effective. Um, and one of the examples that um, Kincaid uses is this example of what's called the Real ID Law, which is actually passed in the wake of 9-11. Uh, the Bush administration, with help from Congress, passed a law basically that said all state driver's licenses, the that piece of paper or piece of plastic that you carry around in your wallet, uh, has to comply with certain uh, printing and traceability standards. Um, and so all states were given um, a certain amount of time to comply. Well, right now, uh, you can click on this link. There's still five non-compliant states and territories. There's 24 compliant states and territories and about 26 states and territories that have an extension just through this year. Their, their um, driver's licenses still aren't compliant with this real ID law. And the real ID law, and you can read in the text, was... Uh, a huge issue, a bone of contention with the states um, as an unfunded mandate. You're telling us our driver's licenses have to have to resemble this standard, but that's going to cost us a lot more money to revamp and retool to comply. And so we still see that compliance is really a, only about 50%. And so the Posner article I have you read, he talks about a few categories of significant mandate actions and he gives some examples. For example, education. The No Child Left Behind Act in 2002 um, was a bipartisan act. Um, if you actually see the picture of the signing ceremony, President George W. Bush signing No Child Left Behind, directly behind him is uh, Senator Ted Kennedy. And it would be hard to, to think of two people who were further apart um, politically than Senator Ted Kennedy and President George W. Bush, but they worked together to get No Child Left Behind passed. Um, and in fact, there were many states who were uh, in the 90s felt that we needed something that would standardize um, education standards in the United States. This was the result of that. Um, but yet it became a, a real, it has become quite a bone of contention and the Obama administration as you know changed the No Child Left Behind Act um, providing waivers and we're so now we're actually on to the the scheme where No Child Left Behind testing is not necessarily required but it's a, it was a significant mandate. Um, welfare reform uh, many of you have read on the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act of 1996 which again was a bipartisan effort between a Republican Congress and Democratic President Bill Clinton. And what kind of mandate did this uh, have in it? Well, the mandate basically was that when states carried out uh, uh, welfare programs, 
they had to also carry out programs that ensured recipients were working or looking for jobs. Um, and that was a mandate uh, that the states also had to fund. Um, election administration, in the wake of uh, sort of the messed up <laughs> federal election, presidential election in the year 2000, um, where it was demonstrated that there were vastly differing standards state to state in terms of ballots, in terms of voting machines, in terms of um, counting ballots, in terms of how ballots were validated or invalidated. Um, this act tended more towards standardization of voting. Um, again, a mandate on states. And then Homeland Security, I mentioned the Real ID Act, but uh, at least one student is writing a project on uh, you know, the idea of the National Incident Management System, that the federal government, when there is an emergency, mandates that states comply with a national system, that states really aren't um, free to have their own command and control sort of structure. Um, they can't, they do their own command and control, but they have to be compliant with certain uh, ways of structuring that system. And so these are all significant mandate actions that Posner mentions. And then there's this idea of preemption. Preemption means simply that uh, federal law just displaces state law. And, you know, I give a couple examples here of where, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 basically overturned a lot of laws, particularly in the South, that disenfranchised minorities. Um, and so, the, but that preempted state law in most cases. The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act, the Consumer Protection Act of 2010, it preempted a lot of state banking regulations in the name of, uh, per, you know, keeping banks from failing uh, and protecting consumers from banks and other financial institutions who were subject to failure. But again, uh, banking laws had formerly been uh, especially several decades earlier, um, kind of a domain of the state. And so uh, Kincaid also mentions this idea that uh, coercive federalism can mean restrictions on state taxation and borrowing. Um, maybe maybe you've heard of this law, ERISA, uh, which was the law that uh, was set up in 1974 to govern pensions. Well, uh, many states had had actually prior to that time been been taxing uh, pensions. Well, um, ERISA restricted them from taxing many forms of pensions. Um, then we have this entire confusing regime on the collection of sales tax for online purchases. Um, there was a 1992 court decision imposing uh, a requirement that for a state to charge sales tax. Um, for an uh, online purchase, that company had to have a significant in-state presence. Well, um, you know, most companies don't have an in-state presence um, in the state that you're living in. Um, the Federal Internet Freedom Act restricted states from actually taxing on the access for internet use. Um, many states have have uh, joined the streamlined sales and use tax agreement, which is not a law, but it's a way for states to try to recover some sales tax. And there's even discussion of a national value added tax. And why is that? Because there are many states actually uh, who don't have an income tax. There are about six states that don't have an income tax that depend heavily on sales tax. And with the advent of online shopping, uh, this is really cut into the revenue. But uh, the notion that um, somehow the federal government is not teaming up with the states and allowing them to collect um, sales tax, um, it, you know, strikes some as a form of course of federalism. And the last thing I kind of want to talk about in this vein is this idea of federal judicial intervention. So it's not just Congress um, that uh, coerces states, if you will, um, there, there are the courts. And so here's some really, uh, I picked out some, what I thought were some pretty, uh, pertinent Supreme Court decisions. Um, there's about three, there's more really, but there's about three classic 14th Amendment decisions. And you know, the 14th Amendment, 
has the Equal Protection Clause. And uh, the 14th Amendment was passed after the Civil War and said that states cannot deny equal protection under the law, just like the federal government can't deny equal protection under the law. Um, and the fact that it was routinely ignored by states, notwithstanding, there were some important decisions that were based in the 14th Amendment. So the Plessy versus Ferguson actually was sort of a negative. It said that separate but equal was legal. Uh, but that was reversed by the Brown versus the Board of Education Act, the very famous act of 1954, which actually said separate but equal schools are not uh, are illegal under the 14th Amendment. Um, and then Loving versus Virginia, this act case you've probably heard of. This uh, Supreme Court case actually struck down a Virginia law as late as 1967, which forbade uh, interracial marriages. Um, and the state of Virginia had argued that marriage was, you know, in its purview, and this the federal government really had nothing to say about uh, marriage. So if, if the state wanted to say uh, African Americans and Caucasian Americans can't be married to each other, then that was its right, but that was struck down in this case. In the same vein, the Defense of Marriage Act uh, was struck down on Fifth Amendment grounds in 2013. Um, and that was the case where the Supreme Court said, you know, uh, the, the federal government could not define marriage in the way it did um, as one man and one woman. Um, and then that led to the last, the very last point there, that same-sex marriage was allowed in, in 2015 by the Supreme Court. In spite of the fact that um, states really had complete purview over marriage laws. Um, and then I, let me go backwards to the Affordable Care Act. We know that in 2012, the individual mandate uh, was upheld by the Supreme Court as a tax. And... We also know in the same decision that Medicaid expansion was not required by the state. So that particular Supreme Court case resulted in something of um, a little bit of a, of a jumble uh, regarding the Affordable Care Act. We, all of us are really still required to have health insurance or we pay a penalty. And so all of you get that form. We all get that form in advance of our filing our income tax to where we have to uh, certify that we have health insurance. And so the individual mandate was upheld. But uh, more importantly for federalism, the Medicaid expansion, um, which means that people who uh, earned up to 133% of the fe federal poverty uh, income uh, would be supported, would be supplemented by Medicaid for health insurance. But uh, in the original law, it said the states will do that. Well, the Supreme Court struck that down, and so several states have not expanded Medicaid, and many states have. So again, we have a little bit of a jumble in how states carry out health insurance. And so I kind of, the last thing I want to do here is talk about Posner's article and uh, towards the last part of the article he he presents these things he doesn't call them hypotheses but they really are um, he talks about uh, four assertions about um, coercive federalism and so he gives some examples let's of each in the article go back to this slide that I'd I like introduced you to earlier this conditions of course read those federalism. examples but and think about I just think that do these conditions these, exist, and, uh, and to what extent do these conditions exist? Are interesting because, and then they're um, actually invitations. Think about a few questions that research. I've posed, um, um, and I so pose some federal similar political in the cohesion. discussion. He says but, that federal but mandates not exactly, tend to but increase something similar just uh, to the extent that relevant federal that officials are unified to this and mobilized to advance. To uh, question one: After we, you know, we talked about Madison and Hamilton. What do you think Madison would think of our current situation? I don't know. Um, are we better off or worse off when the policy agenda is nationalized? Is this concept of states' rights valid or is it simply code for the imposition or denial of rights to minorities? Um, are national standards in areas such as education useful? I mean, 
you know, uh, is there a role for national standards in K-12 education? Can local standards play a role? And who determines what national standards should be? And ultimately, uh, ultimately, what really are the policy and legal purviews for various levels of government? And then how do you answer those kinds of questions and how do you square them uh, with your understanding of the Constitution? So in the discussion this week, I want you to spend some time and put together a little essay and, and talk about some of these questions. You'll see the exact way I phrase the question in the discussion board, but um, I'm looking forward to seeing your responses. They've been really great up to now, so I'm looking forward to seeing a lively discussion on this. Thanks very much.